South Africa is experiencing a massive wave of craft beer in the country. There has been an explosion of microbreweries throughout the nine provinces. This is their story. This is Brewing the Republic. Microbrewing, we are just starting. You know, in SA, it is just right in the beginning of this huge wave. So strap yourselves in. It's it's, it's right in, in its infancy, but we want to take it uh, as far as it can go. So we'd love to, for you guys to to come along with us. Craft beer is brewed by people that's passionate about beer. Craft beer doesn't make any excuses for the flavour that's in the beer and good, wholesome, natural product. Beer just, it's sort of a, a equaliser to a certain extent. It cuts across all boundaries, whether it's race, religion, sex, whatever. People just love beer and when, when we're all having a couple of beers, it's just fantastic, I think. The flavors and the diversity there, it's, it's always an, a different experience from each and every cast basically that you get. That's amazing. Craft beer tells a story, you know, whether it's location based. Ingredients that are specific to one region. the name of, of the beers, the name uh, of the brewery. I think it's, it just tells a story. It just goes that, that little bit deeper. For me, brewing craft is, I'm passionate about it. It's the quest for perfection. It's the quest for that great beer and all your time and attention goes in there. But I think that's what, what, what craft beers bring to the table. It's just a, a bigger range of beers and, and tastes that people can experience. Crop beer is pure. Um, it is flavoursome and it is just what beer is meant to be. For me it's a philosophy. It's making different beers, making beers that are interesting, challenging, innovative and constantly evolving your beer styles that you're bringing out. But it's that kind of pioneering spirit that I think the craft brewers really have and that's for me what craft is all about. Every single brew is different, which means there's a lot of effort which you have to put in. In the end of the day, if you enjoy the beer, um, you can taste it, okay? It's uh, something different. There's, this is the beer with the soul, okay, with the heart. I didn't like beer. I, I hated beer. It was something that you drank before you went to Clippies and Coke uh, on a hot summer's day. Um, and a couple of years ago, I, I drank a craft beer and I, and I realized there's, there's, there's life in this, there's, there's flavor, there's aroma. It's just not bitter and, and, and water. It, there's really, there's something here and, and it kind of tickled me. 
I think it's a type of art. It's, it's an art to brew a, a good craft beer. And you keep on changing and experimenting. Um, so so that's, that's what I think a brewmaster is, is somebody that, that experiments with different tastes, different styles. And you have to understand the technical part of that as well. That's quite an artisanal thing to do. I'd say the hardest thing about starting a brewery would be probably the amount of time that you have to invest in it. Uh, you, need to, you need to make sure it's your love because it takes up 16, 17 hours of your day. Uh, if you don't love what you're doing, that's, that passion is going to disappear very quickly and it will show in your product. If one is going to look at it as being commercially viable, uh, then I think the hardest part is probably putting together the investment that's needed to actually get the thing off the ground. Um, it's, not, it's not a cheap business to get into. Om die nodige geld by mekaar te kry, om een goeie kraafbrouwerij aan die gang te sit, is, is moeilik. Ons is op die oomlik in een verskrikkelijk moeilike ekonomische toestand in Zuid-Afrika. Daarom kry jy nie eindelijk goeie um, leenings by die banken nie. So jy moet ergens anders um, soek daarvoor. It's an interesting process that I went through. I mean, I'd initially had a budget of 30, 25 for equipment, five working capital. And the guy says to you, this is, this is how you, you go into the different, obviously you select the brew house you want, the brand, and then they've got the different size units and you say, okay, we can afford five million for a brew house. I've got another 20 to spend. What they don't tell you is you can do jack shit to that brew house. You've now got to pipe it up. You need fermentation vessels, you need auxiliaries, which is your, your filtration plant, your cooling units. And when you start adding up all that stuff, that 20 million... <laughs> the bottling line costs seven. But you can do nothing with the bottling line without the capo, without the, the labeler. You need 12 million bucks to buy that thing. You know, we didn't set, set out to build something on this scale, but we did set out with a vision of creating a great product and a great brand. We were just fortunate that we got the right investment that able to get us to this level. Once you've got the money, that's when it really starts. You start dealing with the liquor board, the municipality, but after dancing through hoops for about three years, we finally got everything sorted. One of the biggest challenges we've seen here at Drifter is the uh, amount of excise tax we have to pay per beer. So every litre of beer we produce, we have to pay a certain amount of tax. Now, coming from uh, where I learned to brew in the States, um, it's, it's quite different in how the legislation is structured, is that they support small local um, businesses and, and want them to succeed and grow. So what they have uh, in the States is they have a tiered structure. So you pay your excise tax depending on what volumes you produce. So of some of the bigger, more um, mass-produced beers in South Africa that produce, say, four to five million liters a day, here we're producing a thousand liters a day, we must pay the same amount of excise tax. So in a way, it's very uh, unfair and it's not, doesn't, doesn't help small businesses grow. I, I think to find the team, uh, to find dedicated people who really love what they are doing, who bring the passion already in the first place. And I'm very fortunate that I created the team and that I have found the people.
the journey of going from a homebrew to this is just unbelievable. People ask me like, why do I homebrew? Why do I want to brew beer? Like, why don't I just go to a bottle store and buy some beer? For me, it's just like the whole interesting aspect of making something that's your own. It's like cooking. Like when you make your own meal, it's more rewarding than actually just going out and just paying for it. Been brewing beer at home now for a little while, not the longest of times, and trying to get more knowledge about what goes into making beer. My very first beer that I brewed actually went well. It actually went so well because I was so concerned and so worried from what I've heard from my friends and from what I read on the internet and from what I've just general research that you have to be super clean, that you have to be super pedantic, that you have to be super diligent and you know just washing and cleaning and just being super super hygienic um, so that you don't cause any kind of infection to your beer. So my very first beer that came out was actually awesome. My confidence level was so high and I decided, you know, I'm gonna enter the Southeasters Homebrew Festival and I'm gonna actually show people how good my beer is. Murphy's Law decides to say, oh, hey, I'm gonna infect your beer this time. So by going to Southeasters, uh, kind of took a batch that wasn't fully, uh, it was infected. <laughs> From what we, you know, the other home brewers had spoken to me about, they told me that they think that in my fermenter there must have been some kind of bacteria. So, yeah, for me, I wanted people to see that. I wanted to see that, you know, not everything is going to go well. Not everything is going to go your way. Not everything is going to be as it should be, that you expect it to be. You know, there is going to be bumps in the road. And unfortunately, my bump in the road was in front of everyone. <laughs> Oh, it's just an awesome hobby. And if I can turn this hobby into like something that's fruitful for me in the future, I mean, that'll be amazing to, to go from being this to own your own brewery one day. That would be awesome. In order to understand where beer comes from, it's important to know how it's made. Beer is a food source, so you need raw ingredients. Water, malted barley, hops, and yeast. And it all starts with barley. A batch like this. If you now malt this, you'll get about 306 tons of malt. And if you turn that into beer, it's about 7.8 million dumpings, 340 mil cans. So at all times, we've got 11 batches like these in process. Firstly, no barley, no beer. Um, better barley, better beer. You can make a bad beer out of good malt, but you can't make a good beer out of bad malt. I think it's the most important raw material and it creates all the flavours, all the mouthfeel and, and I think it's actually where great beer began.
Malted barley is brought to the brewery and it is then lightly crushed in a process called milling. Base grains and speciality grains are added into the mill. The base grain forms the majority of your beer, whereas the speciality grain is more tailored towards a unique style. So it's always the quest for the perfect crush. If it's too coarse, we can't extract the sugars from it. If it's too fine, you get a stuck mash. So here, there's some pieces that appear to be whole, but if you touch them, you'll see they break apart, which is what you want. You want that whole husks to be um, in place, and you want the grain just to be cracked so that we can get in there where all the good things are stored. So I'm happy with this. This will be hopefully good beer. Okay, so this is basically the heart of the brewery, where it all starts, the brew house. Um, up above, we have this red chute where we bring all the mold malts in, the grains in, and we start in the mash then. After the milling process, the crushed grain is then mixed with warm water to extract all the sugars in a process called mashing. The next step is lautering, where the sticky substance known as wort is extracted from the spent grain. The unwanted spent grain is sometimes discarded, or most often given as feed to livestock. I don't think you can compromise on, on malt. Um, the, the, the malt that you use gives you the, the colour of your beer. The malt that you use gives you flavour in your beer. And the malt that you, you if, if it's low quality malt, um, the extraction of, of sugars out of the malt is going to be very bad. So you're not going to have a good beer. At one stage we thought we were going to get a bargain, right? And we got some low grade malt. Right, at a very good price. In the final analysis, right, it was not worth the while. And a batch or two of our beer did suffer, right, in terms of quality. So yes, malt is extremely important. In South Africa, um, we don't get specialized malts here. We have to import the special, speciality malts, um, like the, the caramel malts, the, um, um, the, the, even the wheat malt we have to import from, from overseas. I get most of my malt from overseas and I mean it's I get high quality malt and it does definitely play a big role in, in the output of your product and it's it's actually really fun because you get so many different kinds of grains now my Schwartz beer it has nine different grains in it and I know I should drop it a little bit to make my life a bit easier but I know from the beer what each grain is doing to that beer, so I don't want to drop it. So you, know, you get some grains that are adding that dark fruitiness to a beer, and it's a crystal malt, but other crystal malts won't do that. And same with the, the black malt, some add coffee and chocolate, some add a bit more burnt toast. So knowing what you're doing with the grain is, is also extremely important. Uh, I think a good uh, example is the Harvest Lager, which won uh, international gold medals, uh, where I use 11 different molds uh, and try to showcase the mold. Yes, the mold is very important. And if you brew, uh, for example, a Munich Dungle or a Pilsner or a Lager, uh, you need to have the best molds available in the world. Otherwise, it won't win awards. Water is always the, the last thing that every home brewer does because it's the most complicated. I once called it, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the middle child of the family. You know, it's there and everyone knows he's, you know, it's, it's an important part of the family, but it's overlooked. You can never get a good beer without a good water. That's the basic part about it. And, uh, you know, the first thing that you always do before you start brewing or after you've brewed your beer, you need to make sure that you've got your right pH levels in your water. So in order for you to get the right kind of beer that you're looking for, 
you must remember that bad water causes a bad beer. You're never going to get a right beer if you, if you don't have right water. I remember one time, you know, like I had, um, I don't know what was, what was happening with, because I just didn't filter my water. I didn't treat it at all completely. Um, and I brewed and the beer just came out quite salty. And I was, couldn't figure out, like, why is this beer so salty? Um, and it was primarily because of that, because I used what you call <laughs> um, a handy Andy to wash one of my fermenters. <laughs> and that was during my homebrew days. Um, and ultimately, you know, that also affected, you know, the beer in, in the end. Historically, uh, we have styles like Pilsers and Pilsen, uh, Stouts in Dublin, more bitter beers in London, and more importantly in Burton, because of the water. There's, there's beer styles that are built around specific water profiles. Luckily, in our track history, we can really speak between, uh, you know, Smack and Growler. In, in Smack's case, even though we were right in the middle of urban, inner city, concrete jungle Joburg, the water quality there was uh, actually really good. We, the only thing we really had to do is adjust the pH uh, every now and then, and, and a couple other little things. And here, being in, in Hearts of Beer Sport now, I mean, behind us, there's a mountain range and uh, we're able to access uh, spring water from the mountain range. So we've actually, in our case, got, got really lucky because we have, haven't had to treat uh, much of the water that we use, apart from slight adjustments there. Well, I, I mean, it's, it goes without saying, if a beer contains 5% alcohol, it fundamentally contains 95% water. So water being the key ingredient, is of utmost importance, and uh, we are very, very fortunate in this brewery in that we, uh, we can access um, spring water from, from Table Mountain. The guys that made Pilsner Iroquois originally try to emulate um, Pilsner water from somewhere else. You would never get Pilsner Iroquois. It is one of the, the beers that's made with, with a very soft water. The same principle as we, what, what we are trying to do is use our water without altering it chemically, okay? So that in, in the long run, your beer or our beer, right, develops a character, right, own to Dolström's beer or Dolström's water. Once the wort has been collected, it is transferred to the boiler and, depending on the style, hops are added at different stages of the boil. When boiling is complete, the hot liquid goes through a whirlpool motion to help separate trub. Now, trub is the leftover proteins and hop debris not wanted in the beer. Hops are to beer a little bit like herbs are to food. So they're used in small amounts, but they're used to, to flavor. So they're not fermentable in any way, they don't make any alcohol. So hops are unique in beer. There's no other product, commercial alcohol product that uses hops. And hops are there for two things. One, to create bitterness, which is intrinsic in beer to a more or less degree. And the second thing, and more importantly, probably for the craft industry, is to create aroma and flavor in the beers. Here in the brewery, we're used to them arriving in their pelletized form and sometimes you neglect to think of where that's actually come from and how it's grown and it's actually a plant. I would highly recommend the hops tour if anyone can get a, a spot on those tours. Uh, basically they took us around the hop farms in George, um, showed us the farms obviously where the hops are grown and yeah, Lauren from SAB was such a great tour guide. We got to see a, a crop of Southern Promise. It was great to see how they process it, um, and it was great just to spend the day out there. And then you're with fellow brewers, so it's always good to chat about beer and hops and everything while you're doing it. Okay, we're inside the, the picking shed at Haydercrane on the hop farm. Those two long structures are the two picker heads. Put the hops through that machine, and the hops are combed off gently with some leaf and lateral. Uh, the second half of the machine is the cleaner. The function of this part of the machine is to separate the leaf and the hop. Um, it's done in two stages. We have three of these fine mesh units. How they function is there's a rotating fine mesh inside, 
fan sucking air through that fine mesh. Hop is round, rolls down, leaf is flat, sucked onto the fine mesh, separated. That happens three times. After that process, we have six, um, we call them dribble belts. They're angled belts. It's the same principle. The first belt is flatter, the last belt's deeper. It's the same principle in that hops around, they'll roll off the belt, down the belt. Flat leaf gets rotated over the belt and separated at the end of the process. In South Africa, we're very lucky to have a lot of incredible hops grown locally, which you can use and work really well in a lot of beers. Um, and then we've got amazing people in the industry here in South Africa that bring in hops from Washington and Oregon State, from Germany, from Czech Republic, from all over the world, even New Zealand. I think people in South Africa know, they know beer as lager. So they're not used to smelling a beer, looking at its appearance or, or getting those hoppy flavors. So this is really where we love to break the mold and, and push it as far as we can. Uh, and just to show how far away you can actually get from a commercial lager. And hops is the tool that allows us to do that. And uh, just to, to free people's minds up, to show them what a beer can actually be. For the brewing process, I mean, especially if you're producing a Pilsner, which is one of my uh, favorite beer types, it's a hop character. Uh, the flavor of hop characters, aroma of hop character, um, so important in your product. The beer is then cooled to a lower temperature and transferred to a fermentation vessel. Depending on the style of beer, different strains of yeast are added to the beer and fermented for a few days. After fermentation, the beer goes through a phase of conditioning where unwanted flavors settle out and the beer can mature. Yeast is actually the only worker in a brewery. We as brewers only make wort. Yeast, I've got billions and billions of them in my payroll. They, they come cheap, they work in unforgiving uh, circumstances, but they are the little fellas that take the, the wort and change it into beer. Well, we have a saying in the brewery, uh, if you look after the yeast, the yeast will look after you. So for us, um, yeast being a living microorganism, I, you know, we need to treat it like, like one and look after it day and night. You know, in the medieval, back in the years, they used to call it um, God's gift until this came, they, the name for it came out as it's called now, nowadays we call it the yeast. Yeast helps you with the fermentation. It helps you with the notes. There are certain notes that you get from any different type of yeast that you use when you're brewing. So also yeast plays an important role. When I started brewing as a home brewer, I used to just pitch dehydrated yeast into my fermenters. And when I did that, I thought the beers were fun. And then only afterwards, when I started cultivating my own yeasts, maybe not as at that scale, but in smaller Erlenmeyer flasks, did I realize how different it made my beers, how much better fermentations were. My fermentations finished quicker, they finished cleaner, and the beer definitely just tasted better. And ever since then, even at a commercial scale, I mean, you can see my giant bottle is, I, I find that it's doing my, my beers a lot of um, benefits because I have more control over it as well. Of course, it's cheaper. Um, instead of buying bricks of yeast, I can buy smaller packets of yeast and then scale them up. I can also then play with different strains of yeast. So I'm not, I'm not set on the dehydrated yeast that are available in South Africa, so I can get various strains from White Labs and Y yeast, and it's the, the strains are so exciting. So you can play with with various yeasts there as well. Which, as a brewery, you can definitely set yourself apart from other brewers because of that. You, you're not limited. <laughs> Maar nog steeds die gis is baie belangrijk vir 'n bier. Jy kan nie 'n lager brou met 'n ale yeast of 'n goeie ale met 'n lager yeast. Um, jy moet jou jou gis uitsoek na na die biere wat jy wil brou. Ek I will say being a woman as well, but yeast are like women. <laughs> They want a lot of attention and you really just like you need to you need to look after them. So 
too high temperature, they're unhappy. Too low, they're very unhappy again. So it's just having that fine balance and keeping them happy. If you've got happy heads, you've got a good beer. So it is very important to treat your yeast very well. Remember yeast is a live organism. So when it has stopped fermentation, how you treat it before you use it for your next brew becomes very critical. Um, it can basically cause your beer to go off very quickly if you don't treat it well. So um, I would say yeast is, is, is really one of those very important ingredients in making beer. The fermented beer is filtered, or not, depending on the style of beer, and can sometimes be added to a bright beer tank, where it is then carbonated. So this is the filtration station. We filter most of our beers, except the vice beer and potentially some of the IPAs we will not filter. Um, we do that here, force carbonate, and then go into the bright beer tank where the beer just rests before we package it. And behind me is the packaging facility. So we package into kegs and into bottles. This machine over here cleans the kegs inside, so we don't open the kegs and, and unless it's really required, necessary, or there was a failure of a seal or something. But this head cleans the machine, uh, cleans the kegs with different chemicals. Then we inject it with steam to sterilize the keg, put carbon dioxide in to remove the oxygen, and then the beer goes in under pressure. Um, and it, you'll have a lovely fresh draft beer. On this side, we have our bottling line. Uh, bottles come off the pallet, we hand load it onto the machine, gets labeled, print the best before date, and it goes through the machine. So inside the machine, we rinse the bottles quickly. Then we remove all the oxygen with double evacuation uh, using vacuum pumps. Fill the beer under pressure, put the cap on, goes out the other side through our shrink wrapper where we put it onto pallets into cases. And that is where basically the brewing process stops in here and obviously continues with the consumer. Some brewers in our country are lucky enough to have big machines that bottle yet the majority of brewers still use handheld machines. I, I think brewing is still one of the most rewarding uh, uh, jobs you can or hobbies you can have. You have so much customer satisfaction, so much job satisfaction and uh, to follow a beer from the beginning to the end when it mature, when it develop, uh, when it get perfect. Uh, I think that is something you can't really explain in words. You have to taste it and smell it and feel your product and then you know that you're passionate about what you're doing. I think from an artistic point of view, if you create now, you, you put all this effort and your time in it. For me, a brew day from switching on the light till the end of the day, hanging the apron, is 10 hours. So you're 10 hours focused and very specific in creating this beer. From the moment in the mornings when we open and we switch the light on and we start brewing, I pour myself into the whole process. At no point do I say, ah, oh, this is fine. And then when I sit, and this is two, three weeks later, and I taste this, it's worth it for me. Th then I get so excited. There is something, it's, I think it's in us. We want to create, we want to show off and say, it's like my daughter drawing a picture, say, dad, dad, what do you think? What do you think? We, we, you know, it's so important. So for me, pouring myself into that, it's extremely important. It's a, it becomes a part of who you are. It is certainly a, a rewarding feeling to start the day with a couple of ingredients, some beautiful smelling hops, some tasty malt, uh, some pure water and some fresh yeast at zero degrees and to bring that all to life. Uh, my favourite part about brewing actually is about 
pouring a beer and serving it to my customer and watching their face as they put it to their lips. Um, that, that for me is the best part about being in this industry. The consumer only sees the sexy side of what we do. It's the bottle on the shelf. It's freaking hard work. And there's just so much that can go wrong. Eye on the ball for the whole process, yeah. You know, you, it's process, process, process. It is hard work. Everything is hard work. Anything worth doing is hard work. Um, and you've got to love hard work to be able to do it. You're not going to sit back and just watch the beers rolling off the line. Um, it does take a lot of hard work and constant attention to detail. I think most of the problems in beer come like in bad beer come from not having uh, the right equipment. And I, I can tell you now, um, a lot of brewers in this country are, are held back by their equipment, especially the smaller breweries and the home brewers and that they, uh, we don't have the equipment on hand. You know, I can walk into a, a, a brew shop in Brooklyn and buy a beautiful stainless steel jacketed uh, 100 liter or 50 liter fermenter. You know, if you're a home brewer, you can't do that in this country. The most difficult is especially uh, from year to year um, with changing raw materials, okay, to react um, exact in the right time and um, change your whole recipe that you get uh, your consistency right, okay. And um, this is actually, yeah, what over the years uh, one of the hardest things in a brewery. When brewing a beer, uh, the things that can go wrong is usually hygiene. There's a saying in brewing that cleanliness is next to godliness. Uh, so if you work clean um, and you stay with your processes, you've got your processes toned down, you, usually things don't go wrong, but when they do go wrong, it's very heartbreaking to dump a whole batch of beer down the drain. The hardest part is actually opening up uh, 2,000, 3,000 liters of beer and pouring it straight down the drain and uh, watching that golden nectar just uh, go down into the gutter. So it's something that every brewer will go through and uh, you have to do it, you have to make those calls. But it's not easy when you uh, have to chuck away lots of stock for quality issues. Some days it's, it's, it's jam-packed. If you're brewing and you're bottling and you're filtering, um, you, you need to know what you're doing. And after a couple of batches, you realize there's more to this than just throwing stuff together. There's days that you, you close that door, you go home at night and you just say, tomorrow will be another day. You just. Nothing went well, the mashing got stuck, uh, your pitching temperatures wasn't spot on, its carbonation is not right there for bottling, and some days beer just tastes terrible. That's also true. You know, we don't have a, a, a million rand lab that can tell us what's going on. We've got certain cheap equipment, and furthermore, we've got our tongue. I've learned uh, you do get palate fatigue, and some days you'll walk into the brewery and the beer just tastes crap. And it all comes to experience, I think, um, knowing that there's gonna be lows and there's gonna be highs and, and many days when you don't want to and you're tired and, and, and whatever, just to persevere through because that, you know what, two weeks from now you're sitting at a festival and people are going, this is awesome. And then that job satisfaction just keeps you going for another month or two. And that, that fight to get that ultimate beer, yeah, that's, that's everybody's dream. It's, it, uh, it's impossible to reach, but we keep striving for it. When I wake up in the morning and I roll over at 5.30, like this morning on a cold winter's day, and you're like, last thing you want to do is get up. You get up and you think, oh, what am I doing today? I'm going to go make beer. Awesome. You jump in the shower, you're awake get to the brewery, you're like super stoked to get the day going. And it's just, I think the main thing with craft beer is it's driven by passion. The people that own these businesses and the brewers and people that run these businesses and involved in this industry are super, super passionate. They're not in it to make big bucks. They're not in it because they are forced to be there. They're in it because they enjoy it and they love it. And here we are talking, having a beer at like 11 in the morning, it's awesome.
when you grow up as a kid, your parents sort of tell you, like, this is what you should do. You go to school and they say, listen, math and science, if you don't do that, you're never going to become anything in life. And then you go to varsity and then they tell you this and this is how it's all about and what you should and shouldn't know. And when you're all done with that, you ask yourself, who am I and what do I want to do? And all of a sudden you don't know. And you start thinking, okay, what is the stuff I hate doing? And you start, you know, try and narrow it down. But for some reason, beer has just always been crossing my path. There was a stage in my life where I wanted to just chase money and did the PhD and thought that I'll develop some special technology that will make me billions. But for some reason, beer just kept crossing my path and I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with making it, that challenge of making the perfect brew, meeting people over beers. So it, it actually, it ticks all the boxes for me. It's both casual, it's can be quite serious. It challenges how you think about things, um, challenges your knowledge, and I absolutely love it. Uh, actually, everything I do, I do with happiness. If I go there to prove, it just give me a big feeling. Like, I, I always feel happy when I go. It's make me feel free, actually. I had an amazing job waiting for me in Chicago. Um, I was meant to be working for the biggest liquor distributor in the States. I was going to be the brand ambassador for Patron and Bacardi and make cocktails around the world. Sounds all glitz and gla glamorous, but you know what? There's something special about South Africa and family. Came home, started up my little bakery, and then I just I wanted something more. And beer gave me that avenue to express myself a bit more do things which were a bit more out of the box, a little bit more crazy. And yeah, that's, that's what got me into brewing beer and having fun with it. And also, Flip, who wouldn't want to brew beer? I mean, hello, I have a walk-in cold room where I can go and grab beer anytime. It's like my own bottle store. As I was working in corporate, I had um an interesting uh, job at breweries. I was actually, when I resigned to start this brewery, I was looking after 25 breweries in 14 different African countries as a utilities consultant for SAP Miller Africa. Very high paying salary, uh, exciting work. But you know, as I was moving between different countries, I could see how brewing is profitable, how amazing it is to start something from scratch and just grow it into a big brewery. So um, armed with all the brewing knowledge and expertise, I decided it was time that I come home and start a brewery. But my unique proposition was that I was going to start a brewery in a black township. And what a better place to start a brewery than Soweto. You know, whenever you talk to people in the building industry, they always say double the amount of your expectation time with regards to your finished project. I would have actually said quadruple that time. It took a lot longer than I expected. Yeah, there's just so much that goes into it. The initial phases are quick. It's, you know, you put your roof structure on, you get the, the laying of the cement down, you get your um, bricks up and going, and you think, geez, this is going quickly. But then it's just the complications start to settle in, you know. You've got to think about everything. You've got to think about the lighting. You've got to think about your windows. You've got to think about your aeration. You've got to think about where's the steam going to go when you actually have your brewery in. You've got to think about the drainage. 
You've got to think about the plumbing. You've got to think about all these things, you know. So when it comes to construction, it's, it's not just put up a, a roof and four walls. You've got to think about a lot more than that. There's a lot more that comes with the building than just housing for your brewery itself. When the brewery is actually built and your building is outstanding, there's little teething problems. You might have all your ducks in a row, but the problem is it's the unexpected that actually clubs you. Whether it be your flooring guys who come to actually lay down the floor and you think you've got a perfect flooring and then when the riggers come to fulfill your brew house and to rig it up, then there's a problem with the floors. Your electricity is not fulfilling your brew house enough. It's the electrical bulbs aren't working, the certain bathrooms aren't working, the bar taps aren't working. It's just, it's the unexpected things. Like you've paid someone and everything is done and, and dusted, but then once the dust is settled, more and more things just arise. It's just a constant flow of problems that, that can come across. So for me, the hardest part about starting a brewery must be not knowing what to expect. To fight for something that you believe in, it will be worth it in the end. That's what I believe in. And I believe that with my brewery, that we've put all the efforts in, that we've put all the hard yards into making this the best that we can do. And I can tell you that every single other craft brewery out there is the same, because they all want to make the best that they can do. The distribution is one of your hardest issues as a business um, in terms of the brewing industry in South Africa right now. It's all about partnering with the correct companies and making sure that they will meet whatever you want in terms of your distribution needs. Every brewery is different. Myself coming from a background in the States of brewing, I'm very strict with what I want with my beer. I want it to end up on the shelf tasting how it should, how it tastes here in the brewery. So, that being said, it's all about the scale of your business and how big you want to get and how big you are. Um, if, it's, if you're producing small amounts of volume and you're just supporting your local community, which a lot of breweries are, then just jump in your bucket, chuck your kegs in the back and make sure you clean your lines often. And uh, make sure you taste and sample the beers at every outlet you go to so you make sure your customers are, are getting a product that tastes how you want it to taste. I feel like I'm in a little bit of a different situation where my hub or my base of brewing is in town. So I want to try build a little bit of a, an appearance around the distribution. So whether it's me dragging a keg on a, a wheelie bin up the street or a little two-wheel trolley up the street wearing a metal lane t-shirt and hooking it up myself or whether it's me just driving it somewhere or getting someone else to drive it. The distribution for me while I'm in the situation that I'm in is to keep it as localized as possible and again try to build some a little bit of rapport with the public who are drinking and, and maybe get them interested in visiting the brewery. We've got a good old Bucky and, and Martin, which is our, uh, we call him the logistics manager. It's literally, as the orders come in, we plan our week, uh, we put the orders together, and we get it to the clients as fast as possible. So we pride ourselves on that. If you, if you put an order by Wednesday, you'll have it by the Friday. But it does limit our market. So at the moment, we, we're still pretty much regional based in Gauteng. Um, we know for us to, to go to the next level that we're going to have to step into, into, the, into the next level of actually engaging with proper distributors that can take us beyond cutting borders. For us, we use a distributor, so we don't do our own distribution. Distribution is another headache. If you talk to anybody else that does their own distribution, it's I mean, keeping track of where your, where, your, where your kegs are because kegs are quite expensive. We spent about I think like 1.8 on a keg. Um, and if you don't know where your kegs are, then you're actually just throwing money down the drain. So having a distributor, somebody that keeps track of where your beers is selling, how it's selling, where 
takes orders, delivers, does a whole that whole chain of distribution actually takes your mind off that side of business and therefore you can focus on other things. It's, it's very difficult because you kind of give your beer over, you give your, your product, your baby, the thing that you're kind of saying, I'm proud of this as the way it is. And you don't know a lot of times where it is, how it's being kept, how often it's sold, and you really kind of remove from it. So it, it is quite difficult when you're passionate about beer and you're not just there to say, I'm just here to make a buck and sell a product and I sell it and I'm, I'm done. You want to make sure that, that your product is looked after and that, that the thing that you slaved over for a month is going to be looked after. And as soon as you give it to a distributor, a lot of the times you have no idea. And also getting the restaurants, the outlets to understand how to store your beer. I mean, you'll go into most outlets and see there's the cooler under the counter and the kegs are sitting right next to it. That cooler is pumping out hot air at like 40 degrees and it's blowing it straight onto your keg. So like basically, let's take that thing and heat it up and see what, see what mean things we can do to it. Natural beer should be looked after and respected. So it should generally be kept at a colder temperature. It needs to be cared for. Like any natural fresh product, I mean, our beer isn't filtered, it isn't pasteurized. So distribution is a very hard channel. Luckily, we work with some really good people up in Joburg. We started now a good relationship with people in Cape Town and we do a lot of our local distribution in hand with one of our distributors here. So the main thing is we didn't go and overstretch ourselves and try to be on everyone's shelf in everyone's bar because I know then the beer won't get drunk. We choose a couple of select places in an area and we hope that the people make a conscious choice to, if they're in an area with six different bars and they know that our beer's there, they'll make the choice to go and drink there because they know that they can get a good beer. We like to see ourselves as a podium for craft breweries to shine on. Um, so we kind of give a stage and see behind me is obviously what we call our library of beers. We chalk all our um, uh, branding on the back. We like to give guys with no marketing budget equal playing field as people with multi-billion marketing budgets. Um, so the idea is we, we've grown with a few businesses. Uh, some guys have started out as garage operations and uh, started with giving us a few kegs here and there when they could. Um, and then have grown with us um, and uh, supplying us with up to 10 to 20 kegs a week. Um, so we like to think that we've helped the, the craft beer revolution and we've helped businesses grow with um, obviously providing a route to market um, which gives the little guys an opportunity to sell against the big guys. We've never marketed. I have never advertised. Um, I don't believe in it. We rely on people coming to Gilroy's, people buying Gilroy's, and having a good story to tell from their friends. We've always gone word of mouth. It takes a lot longer. But it's the only way to build that foundation. We've built this brand over 16 years. Slowly trying not to make mistakes, and always making sure that anybody who'd been exposed to that brand had fallen in love with the brand. Just a little bit, but they'd fallen in love with the brand. That's the one element, one of the elements that uh, I think are missing overall within the industry. And um, we also want part of those people that actually don't spend money or time or effort as such on the marketing. We do spend, like there is a bit of marketing, but it's, it's a, in my opinion, it's just not enough. We could do more. We could do more as brew hogs, we could do more as an industry. Hopefully we get there. But obviously the biggest problem we have is the cost. You talk to any brewer, they'll tell you, I don't have money. I do not think, apart from maybe the big five breweries, anybody has a marketing budget. The first thing you think of is buying an extra fermenter. <laughs> you know, instead of spending, 100,000, whatever, on, on a marketing budget. It's just like one of those, unfortunately. So what we've done from the start is we have a lot of quirky, weird and crazy different beers. And each of our beers has a little character and a story behind the beer. And so what we've done is just play off social media marketing where it's, it's free game. 
people, if they want to see something, they'll see it. It's not, not paid to be there. And it's been working really well for us. People enjoy our vibe and what we're about. We're a small family here at Drifter, and we want people to just enjoy our products. We've been here since 1983 and we're planning to stay here for another 100 years. So what we've done, uh, we've, we're relaunching our brand. We've got new labels in our bottle, new logos. So yeah, so say we need it, you know, I mean our brand and the logos was very much the same for, for 30, 33 years. So now all of a sudden we've changed completely. So it's, it's fresh and you need to keep up with what's out there. So it's, I think I will hopefully it will revolutionize our brand in the marketplace. Because otherwise, you know, it just fades away with all the new brands, you know, popping up. I, I think uh, I see marketing uh, uh, from a different perspective for, for us. The customer is still the most important fact in, in our whole setup of, of having a brewery. And uh, therefore, I, I would say tasting the beer brings the beer closer to them. Uh, uh, always have the same quality. It doesn't matter if you drink the beer in Johannesburg, Durban or Cape Town. I think that is very important to have your, your customers, your fans aligned with your brand, uh, supporting each other. I, I think that's the reason we keep 99.5% of our beers in South Africa. We don't export for the gain of money. Uh, we support our South Africans who supported us, who created us. It was their freedom of choice, uh, uh, choosing certain brands they enjoy and they love and they support at the end of the day. South Africa didn't have a beer culture before. They had a drinking culture and, and was a beer drinking country. You know, I mean, it sells a beer far, far outweigh sales of wine, but I don't think there was a beer culture. And I think the craft beer scene has created that beer culture. So you can go to a restaurant and you can expect to find a range of beers on the menu. You can go to places and, and find a beer and food pairing dinner, whereas before people would have thought that was just insane. Beer was something that you had, you know, you smashed a couple by the braai and then you sat down and you had wine. And no one kind of saw beer as being an elevated product. It was pleb class, it was lower class, you know, you had wine and you had whiskey and other spirits and then you had beer. Um, now I think beer really has been elevated where, you know, we, we have food and beer pairings, we have uh, courses on beer, we have beer judges, and beer is really I think it's, it's elevated to the level of all these other kind of premium uh, alcoholic drinks. I think it's the startup of where people realize that beer is not a cheap thing, it can be a quality thing as well. And, and I think that is the main, main focus of where craft beer is going currently, is, is going for uniqueness, going for that quality flavors and aromas, and not for just mass production. I think it's definitely changed the pers perspective that the average beer drinker has about what has been available in market. Um, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, the, the conversation when you went to a place and it was, I'm going to have a lager. The, the, when, when, when you spoke to people about, uh, let's have something different, the choice was, let's have a start. And, and that was it. There was, no, there was no depth in the conversation. Um, there was no alternative. The, the concept of going out for evening, sitting in a restaurant and trying four unique or six unique very different beers didn't exist. And, and that for me has definitely changed the scene that we see in, in the beer market. Um, the average Joe is starting to look at what's available on the menu and start noticing he doesn't have to just pick the three that he's used to. Uh, there is so much more. Many people taste, taste the craft beer now and then they say, oh my hat, I've been robbed my whole life of good beer. Because up until craft beer, we thought the mass produced, that's beer. Now we introduce craft beer and we expose people to ales and wheat beer. And people say, oh my hat, I actually love this more. I thought I was a lager guy, but he forgot it was actually his dad's generation that are the lager guys. We are the new generation. 
for the market to grow, we have to educate the people in the market. It's very important. It's it's everything basically, and it's something that uh, collectively, as the craft beer industry, we have to do. In the ten years that we've that we've been uh, that we've been open in town as a group, um, we've seen quite a quite a big change. In the in ten years ago, we had to explain people what to taste in the different beers and so on. It's been it's changed in the last five years. It's change that you can't believe. People walk into the brewery and they want to taste your IPA or they want to taste your APA and they people people um, understand the, the the hoppiness in the beers, the fruitiness, the um, the style, uh, all in the different styles of beer. So people people are getting very knowledgeable about uh, about the craft industry. Uh, in the beginning everybody was uh, trying to get us to c produce commercial type beers and then slowly but surely they've come around to expecting different flavors and different tastes. Um, they're learning more and more about beer all the time, which is fantastic. The whole beer landscape's changing sort of every year, it changes drastically. Well, it, when we started as craft brewers, um, there was a lot of knowledge gap about uh, craft beer. And I think it's concepts like this of setting up breweries in real places not just industrial places where, which become tricky to visit. You know, so here at Ubuntu Call, for instance, we have people coming in from time to time, and we use that opportunity to take them through our brewery, to show them the brewing process, to explain to them what is craft beer, how is it different from commercial beer. And I think the knowledge gap that was there is closing up so much so that a general consumer in South Africa is starting to understand and appreciate the skill, uh, you know, that goes into making craft beer, the commitment that goes into making craft beer, and the difference between craft and mess-made beers. And it is this knowledge that will help us as craft brewers to gain more market share into this beer market. Yeah, I think a lot of people are getting there. There's a lot of people are very excited about beer. There are a lot of uber beer nerds out there that like live, breathe, eat, drink beer. And then there's also another category of guys that, that really just enjoy, have their, they have their go-to beers, you know, they, they, they know what they like. Some of them like my beer, some of them don't like my beer, but that's cool, you know? As, as long as they know why they like that beer and they go out there and they choose it, and they're always getting what they ask for, it's a slacker, that's what it's about. Over time, you've seen people develop an understanding. Part of our philosophy is obviously ed educating the public and getting them to understand a bit more about beer. Hence, we don't um, just list our beers in a common format, uh, alphabetical or anything. We actually have put a lot of uh, thought into how we present beers. So we present them in styles, we break them down to flavor profiles. Um, so it's important for us, for the consumer, to understand obviously the unique selling point that we have, which is variety. And a part of the experience that we're providing is that, is that people will kind of read what they're drinking, they learn something. It's a great experience for people to be drinking and learning at the same time. We, we try to do our fair part uh, to educate in a, in a, in a nice, uh, cool atmosphere at our tasting room where we educated more or less by now uh, a half million people in the last five years. And uh, I think uh, that is what is important for us, to see the customer uh, as first. Uh, without them, uh, we wouldn't exist and uh, the brand would be worth nothing without the support of South Africans and uh, that reflect at the end in the beers. I mean, uh, we work together, uh, we listen to our customers. Uh, uh, if they want new beers, we create new beers. Uh, SAB has been pretty much supporting the craft bring uh, revolution since it started. It supports home brewers. We have had the uh, South Easters Home Brewers annual days here on our field. We've also supported some of the craft brewers uh, from inception in terms of helping them with technical uh, support as well as uh, on occasion also measuring their beers for them. SAB has given all the craft brewers a 
great sort of help by um, supplying malts and hops from their hop farms locally, um, as well as a lot of the brewers that, that work at SAB are friends of, in, within the brewing community as well and uh, offer assistance and participate in our meetings. So SAB has been a, a great help. I've got so many friends in SAB. And they, they, they come here, we have a couple of beers together. I go to SAB, we have a couple of beers together. We've always got on well. SAB actually got behind the industry because they were about beer. And the ethic behind the people working at SAB has always been of the highest standard. I think SAB has always been the big brother of the beer industry um, since it's been around. And it's been amazing to see how they've helped the smaller guys in terms of sharing knowledge, sharing uh, raw ingredients. And they've always got a, an open door approach, which is great to see. And they, they just want the, the whole beer market to grow. The journey of going from a home brew to this is just unbelievable. You genuinely cannot believe that in a space of three years, I was sitting at home in Cape Town, brewing in a bucket, getting advice from one of my really good friends, telling me, no, don't do this, do this, don't use that, sanitize this, clean that, do this, to what lever does what, what pop goes where, it's just one of those sort of things that when you're driving your first car, you got to understand and you got to feel it. So I've got to get through it. I've got to make sure that I know how my system works. That's the most difficult part, is to you know, think that you know everything rather than actually just allowing yourself to make the mistakes and allowing yourself to actually become one with the brew house. When people go to these festivals, they are exposed to a hidden world of beer. And it's just grown. There's nothing stopping it. And that's what's making things so exciting. And it's, yeah, we're all for festivals. We need more. And it's great to see that people are showing an interest. A fuss, um, look, people come and they taste beers. For me, it's more kind of people come to the festival and they actually get to meet the brewers. You know, they actually meet, let's say, Andre from Cockpit. And next time they see Cockpit beer, they drink it, they're like, yes, I met this brewer, such a nice guy. And they, you know, then they just start getting into beer and tasting new things. It's good for the brewers to, um, to get out there, to, to meet their customers, to meet each other. You know, the brewers come from Cape Town, from Durban, and then they meet each other for the first time. And then next time they in Cape Town, they go visit their brewery and they share ideas. So for me, it's a good networking thing. There's a lot of industry people that come, like suppliers and other restauranteurs, and they come and they also get introduced to new brands. A lot of the brewers of the festival, they leave and they've got at least three, four new restaurants or bottle stores that are now stocking their beer. We try as much as possible to have the industry side of it there as well. So excited, I mean, about 8,000 people coming through today's Capital Craft Beer Festival. It's actually our second one, so yeah, we're expecting great things today. The guys that have come through to uh, enjoy a bit of our beer this morning, full smiles and really happy with the beer. So that's the main, the main aim. This is my fourth Capital Festival, so every year you come back, you see people are more educated. Um, they, they, they're looking to try different styles, you know, they're not just going for the lagers, they're experimenting a bit with, with, with limited release beers and crazy stouts and barrel aged beers. So it's quite cool to see uh, the markets 
educated itself and festivals like these are so important to keep people educated. I think that's the nice thing about the fest. You, you see regular faces, you also see other brewers that you quite, you know, we're quite close as an industry, so it's always good to see everybody. With these beer festivals, there's a great camaraderie with the brewers in that they love to share their ideas, their knowledge, their expertise, and also their beer. You know, um, we're family. It's like, like family. We all see each other, we greet, hug, talk about, we know, we know what, what's going on with everyone. And, that, and that's what I really like about the craft beer industry. It's, it's, it's small, it's intimate, and, and it's personal. I mean, it's freaking cool. I mean, just now I was talking to Henny to help me out with one of those T, what you call elbows, things that connect your pipes and stuff. Because you sometimes forget these small little things when you go to festivals and stuff. You always think about your cakes, your bar, your tabs, and the small minor things you forget. So it's pretty awesome. I actually really like the camaraderie today, yeah. We're lucky enough to have uh, an incredible bunch of people in the industry, and that's home brewers and commercial brewers too. They're all starting to get really, really tight, and when we get together for the, the festivals or for the conferences, we just, we all have a really good time. I must say the one concern I had with regards to my opening night here is that you're out in the bundus and, you know, people have to drive an hour's drive to get here and it's not like as if we have a lot of foot traffic. When we set this brewery up, we didn't have the expectations that we would have people come every single day. We wanted people to come and escape. They, they must come here, they must enjoy themselves and enjoy the landscape that we've got here. I mean, so that's uniquely South African, is to have this kind of place. And for us, that's what Happy Days Brewery is about, is to have you come here and enjoy yourself and experiencing something unique. But you know, having people come here from the surrounding locals, people of Durban, and you know, just friends coming to support you, you know, in your, your new adventure, it's just quite a overwhelming feeling to have. It's to, you know, you feel, you feel good inside that people are willing to make that effort just to come and experience your, a beer with you. And you know, I even had other brewers, like Sean Stand even, pulling in here, tasting my beer, asking me how it's going. And that's the best part, is that you have a fellow brewer who's coming up from Durban and just checking up on you. And that's just what craft beer culture is all about. You're always here to help each other and you're always here to support each other. It's just, that's the best part. 90% of the brewers you meet and the owners of the brewery are such legends. And that's what makes it so cool. I mean, if you think about all other industries, because everyone's a competitor, they're like quite, oh, are we doing this, are we doing that? And that's cool, but like at the end of the day, you can sit around the table and, you know, have, have beers and drink each other's beers and be like, ah, oh, have a laugh and oh, just have a good time. And that's incredible about it. I'm so proud, eh? I actually, sometimes I pinch myself and I'm like, uh, am I really a part of it? No, it's, it's so incredible, eh? There is, without doubt, there is a beer revolution taking place and uh, uh, it's nice to, to have a, a small part in that, you know. I think uh, it's also a very cool industry. It's not like making nuts and bolts and screws, you know. It's, a, it's the sort of thing that, that people are interested in, even, even if they're not beer drinkers themselves. It's exciting because we, we sort of jumped on the, on the craft beer trend probably about 30 years later than the States. All that says to me is that we're going to get to that level very quickly and I think we're going to surpass it because everybody else has done all the mistakes, they've made the mistakes, they've, they've done the hard yards. We're coming in with knowledge about everything and I think we're going to catch up really quickly. That's going to be the next big thing. We just need to, all we need to do is just work together to pinpoint an actual South African flag in the ground of beer style. Well, I think as South Africa, we are very much advanced compared to the rest of the continent. But if you actually look at us versus a country like the United States, for instance, 
uh, I'll say we are where the United States was in the early 90s, but it's so interesting to see that from a base of almost nothing, the United States is sitting now close to 20% of the market share, and that's a massive market we're talking about. And that's the trend I see in South Africa as well. Within the next 10, 15 years, we should be eating very nicely into the beer market share. It's definitely getting to a place now, especially in the past three years, where craft beer is starting to become the, not the flavor of the month, but something that people are actually going to be drinking, continuing from now. So commercial beer will always be a thing. It's, it's never going to go away. It, is, it serves a, a very good purpose. But uh, craft beer is becoming a big thing with South Africans now, especially. I, I don't want to be anywhere else. I don't think the grass is greener uh, uh, anywhere else. I think uh, it's, it's the coolest place to be if you love craft, if you're a craft brewer, or if you uh, just drink craft. I think South Africa gives a huge variety. We live in very exciting times. There's such a huge renaissance of, of craft beer in, in South Africa, and it's, it's very cool to be part of it. Do you have any hangover remedies for boys? Uh, we, we, I've, I've done a bit of research into this myself. <laughs> uh, if you find yourself with a hangover, <laughs> then you're on your own. <laughs> Though the things with the eggs and stuff I don't trust. What I always find is the best hangover cure ever is to just go jump in the cold ocean, go for a swim or a surf, or do something you enjoy. Go for a hike, sweat it out, and then have a beer at the end of the day. Rinse and repeat.